All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Just a few things here at the top, and we'll get right to your questions. Uh, first up, I can confirm that U.S. Central Command personnel re-anchored and re-established the temporary pier to the Gaza beach yesterday. As has been the case in the past, Israeli Defense Force engineers provided all the necessary support to ensure the safe emplacement of the pier on the beach, and there were no U.S. boots on the ground during the re-establishment of the pier. Overnight, the transfer of humanitarian assistance from Cyprus to Gaza resumed with more than 656 metric tons, or 1.4 million pounds, being delivered to the marshalling yard in Gaza today. Since May 17, when the temporary pier first went operational, over 4,100 metric tons, or 9.1 million pounds, have been delivered through the maritime corridor for onward delivery by humanitarian organizations. And I'd like to reiterate that while it's always been our intention for the pier to be a temporary solution as part of the broader international effort to surge humanitarian assistance into Gaza to meet the urgent needs of the Palestinian people, we have not established an end date for this mission as of now, contrary to some press reporting on the matter. Therefore, we'll continue to facilitate the transfer of humanitarian aid via the Maritime Corridor and as always take necessary steps to ensure the safety and security of the personnel operating the pier to include adjusting to sea states in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea the same way we do with aircraft operations in the event of inclement weather or conditions. And finally, the orderly withdrawal of U.S. forces from Niger continues. As AFRICOM highlighted in their announcement earlier this month, U.S. Air Force C-17 aircraft have begun ferrying personnel and equipment out of the country in accordance with the arrangements made between U.S. officials and the CNSP in May. While U.S. personnel numbers will naturally fluctuate during the drawdown period, there are currently approximately 600 U.S. personnel in country, and we remain on track for a complete withdrawal by September 15 as agreed upon. We'll, of course, continue to keep you updated regarding any significant developments. And with that, be happy to take your questions. Go to Associated Press. Hi, General Ryder. Thanks for doing this. Um, with the aid moving back through the pier again, can you give us a sense of how much of it has actually moved out of the marshalling yard and on to it, its ultimate destinations, or is it all still in the marshalling yard? Um, that, that's really a, a question I'll have to direct to USAID and World Food Program. As you know, they're responsible for, for the onward distribution. Uh, and so um, they're, they're in the best position to talk about the, the current status of that aid and, and what their game plan is to deliver it. And World Central Kitchen said they were not using the pier in any way. So is it just World Food Program participants that are using this pier? Uh, again, I'd, I'd refer you to USAID. I know they're working, obviously, with uh, humanitarian organizations to include the World Food Bro Program for distribution. But again, I think the important point here is that this is just one part of a broader international effort that consists of aid being delivered via a maritime corridor, the air, and of course, uh, ground being the, the optimal way to get aid. Um, but Again, we're going to continue to push as much aid into Gaza as we can. And are there any updates on airdrop operations? Uh, I don't have an update to provide other than the fact that we will continue to conduct uh, airdrops uh, to get aid into Gaza. You haven't since the Rafa operation started, or did you have an intermittent start? Um, let me uh, look at we've done between March 2nd and today. Uh, there's been 39 humanitarian assistance airdrops. Uh, the last drop was on June 9th, uh, but again, we will maintain uh, the option and have the capability and will conduct airdrops in the future. Let me go to Jim. Um, General Ryder, how concerned is the Pentagon that war could break out on the Lebanese border with Israel right now? Yeah, so of course, uh, this is something that we're continuing to follow very closely, Jennifer. Um, you know, we, as we've mentioned before, um, we do have concerns about tensions along that border. Uh, we continue to encourage a, a diplomatic solution, um, and so we're going to stay very focused on that. And what was the purpose of the USS Ford coming in for a port call? Um, the USS Ford coming to a port call? I, I was, well, maybe I misread that they were in the Mediterranean. Is that, uh, that I'm not tracking right. that, so, okay, yeah. I, that, that's a mistake. Um, in terms of Putin's vis visit to North Korea and to Vietnam, um, how seriously do you take this new uh, mutual defense treaty? Is this a return to the Cold War? Is it uh, 
being seen? Are you seeing additional weapons moving from North Korea to Ukraine? Um, how serious do you take this relation, new relationship? And just to clarify, you said Vietnam. Do you mean DPRK? I mean, uh, North Korea. Yeah, North Korea. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously something that we're continuing to monitor very closely. Um, as you've heard others in the U.S. government talk about, you know, there, there is no surprise here that they've been developing and fostering this relationship. Uh, so, so it is something that we're going to take seriously, and it's something that we're going to continue to monitor. Um, but what we've also said is that our focus when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region, and, and broadly speaking worldwide, is to work with like-minded nations on security and stability uh, throughout the world to include the Indo-Pacific region. So we're going to continue to strengthen and bolster those alliances and those relationships uh, with the idea that, that our focus is on peace, security, and stability, um, but certainly are also going to continue to keep a close eye on this. And in Vietnam, Putin said that Russia is considering <coughs> changing its nuclear doctrine, its first use doctrine. Do you take that seriously, or is this just nuclear saber, saber rattling? You know, we've, we've seen nothing at this point uh, that would require us to change our own uh, strategic forces posture. Again, it, it's not the first time that we've heard of reckless uh, nuclear saber rattling. It's certainly irresponsible for countries that maintain these types of capabilities to make those kinds of comments. Um, but again, I go back to what I said earlier, that our focus is on security and stability, uh, not only in the region, but throughout the world. And so we'll continue to stay focused on that. Let me go here to CNN. Thanks, General Ryder. So National Security Advisor Sullivan said earlier this week that with regards to the policy allowing the U.S. to, allowing Ukraine to use U.S.-made weapons to strike over the border into Russia, that policy, quote, extends to anywhere that Russian forces are coming across the border from the Russian side to the Ukrainian side. So is that consistent with the Pentagon's understanding of this policy, or has the policy expanded beyond just that kind of narrow Kharkiv region that it was initially understood to be uh, when this policy decision was made? Yeah, so there, there has been no change in the policy. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, this comes down to counterfire, right? And what you saw in the Kharkiv region as Russia was conducting its offensive was the massing of, of forces, artillery fire, preparatory fire into Ukraine uh, as they conducted these operations. And so uh, the ability to be able to fire back when fired upon uh, is really what, what this policy is focused on. So again, as we see Russian forces uh, firing across the border, uh, you know, the ability for, for Ukraine to fire back at those ground forces uh, using U.S. provided munitions, it's self-defense. And so it makes sense for them to be able to do that. And that applies only to the border areas, or could it be further into Russia, or does that... Uh, again, you know, if you if you look back at kind of the early days of this war and you had Russian forces that were, you know, and still are to a large degree, but in mass within Ukrainian occupied territory, what you saw were force on force conflicts that were happening within sovereign Ukraine. So in this case, what you see is Russian forces attempting to use their border uh, as a safe zone from which to conduct preparatory fires and attacks into Ukraine uh, in support of offensive actions. And so again, as we see those forces conducting those types of operations uh, from across the border, we've explained, you know, Ukraine can and does have the right to fire back uh, to defend themselves. So again, not a change to the policy that was announced earlier. Now, when it comes to long term or excuse me, long range munitions like attackums, uh, again, there's been no change in the policy in, the, in that regard. But it's broader than just Kharkiv, to be clear. Correct. It, it, you know, it's focusing on the strategic intent here, which is counterfire when you're attacked, you know, returning fire. Body. Thank you, General. Uh, if I may go back to the situation uh, on the borders between Israel and Lebanon, <coughs> obviously you've been um, um, looking at the tension there. Um, in, in terms of um, how tense the situation, are you seeing an indication that this is uh, higher than before and that could lead to a wider confrontation? And do you believe there's still room for a uh, diplomatic solution between Israel and, and Lebanon? Um, so the, the latter part of your question first, yes. Uh, you know, I think there's always time to talk, and there's always room for diplomatic solutions. Um, I, I think given the amount of, um, uh, you know, rocket fire we've seen going from both sides of the border, um, we've certainly been concerned about that situation, uh, and both publicly and privately have been 
urging all parties to restore calm along that border and again to seek a, a diplomatic solution. And so, um, you know, you've heard uh, the White House talk about the fact that they've sent a special envoy. Uh, Secretary Austin, this is something that he's spoken about uh, with his counterparts in the region. Uh, and so, again, this is something that will continue to stay focused and on. And is the situation between Israel and Lebanon and, and maybe a, a potential for es escalation, uh, has this prompted the DOD to maybe uh, review the U.S. forces posture in the region or, or change it in any way so far? Uh, as of right now, I don't have any announcements to make in terms of a force posture. Um, again, I, th I think, you know, seeing the force through the trees here, what we don't want to see uh, is a broader regional conflict. Uh, and so, again, we're going to stay very focused on working with the rest of the, the U.S. interagency and with our partners in the region uh, to attempt to uh, ensure that that doesn't happen and that this is resolved diplomatically. Thank you. Let me go to the phone here real quick. Reuters, Idris. Hey, um, just a quick question. Could you, um, I may have missed this, but how much aid is currently in the marshalling area? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a number to provide, Idris. I'd, I'd refer to USAID uh, to talk about how much aid uh, they currently have for onward delivery. Is there a capacity at which point aid cannot gather at the marshalling area anymore, or uh, is that not a concern? Uh, I mean, there, there is a uh, certain capacity uh, that the marshalling area can hold. I don't know that we've reached that uh, at this stage, um, but, you know, certainly that's a factor. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a specific amount to provide to you. Okay, let me go in the room here, Tony. A couple of uh, geopolitical questions. I wanna, uh, on the North Korea, Russia, is the Pentagon assessing or will, uh, what types of technologies Russia may give to uh, North Korea that they haven't in the, in the past? I'm thinking ballistic missile guidance technology or along those lines. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, I, I don't have any details, nor am I gonna, uh, discuss in detail any agreements between Russia and the DPRK at this point. Again, I'd go back to what I said earlier. Um, not, we're not surprised about this continuing uh, burgeoning of this relationship. It's something that we're going to monitor closely. Um, and, and again, you know, what you have seen in the past is uh, the DPRK providing Russia with munitions that are being employed in Ukraine. Uh, killing Ukrainians uh, and supporting Russia's illegal war. So uh, again, definitely concerning uh, for all those uh, nations that uh, respect sovereignty, uh, respect the rule of law. Um, but yeah. okay. Ukraine weapons question. The White House today announced that it was directing American contractors to ship AMRAAM and Patriot weapons missiles that were earmarked for foreign customers other foreign customers to Ukraine, giving them the priority. What role does the Pentagon have in this directive, in implementing this directive or overseeing the shift of missiles from FMS customers to Ukraine? Yeah, sure. I, um, you know, to your to your point, as you highlighted, uh, the the resequencing uh, of planned deliveries. Um, I think missile deliveries, not planned. What's that? You say planned deliveries? No, planned. Okay. The planned Sorry. resequencing of planned deliveries. Um, so we're working closely with industry uh, on the appropriate contracting actions uh, from this resequencing to ensure that we're able to continue to support our security assistance requirements. So uh, I'm not going to be able to go into any specifics beyond that in terms of, you know, uh, what those contracting actions are, those, those companies are. But uh, needless to say, again, we're going to make sure that not only are we supporting Ukraine, uh, but that we're continuing to keep on track with uh, those FMS deliveries as quickly as possible. These are missiles, right? Not the correct. batteries or correct. Round These equipment. are missiles. Okay, thank you. That's correct. All right, Noah. In reference to the policy on cross-border strikes, I just want to make sure I understand the clarity. Was the policy never geographically bound, um, and was always focused on the intent of counterfire, like you're describing there? Um, just want to make sure that I, I understand this correctly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. You know, the, the context was, again, this Russian offensive that was emanating from the Kharkiv region. And so being able to check that offensive and enable the, the Ukrainians to fire back uh, and to not allow Russia to use that zone across the border there as a safe haven from which to conduct those attacks. Mm -hmm. So it, 
changed in reference to the offensive near Kharkiv, but it was never intended just to be around Kharkiv, if I understand you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the policy here is, again, um, and, and I think, uh, you know, the National Security Advisor put it, uh, you know, in, in great words here in the sense that it's not about geography, it's about common sense, right? Being able to fire back if you're fired upon. Let me go to Tom. Thanks, Gerald. Um, Abdul Malik Al Houthi, the leader of the Houthi rebels today, gave a speech in which he said that British, I'm sorry, U.S. and British airstrikes have had no effect at all on the group. Could you comment on that? Um, well, they started with a certain amount of capability, and now they have a less amount of capability. So that's just factually incorrect. But the, 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 the tempo and severity and damage caused by the attacks is increasing, um, and obviously the stress that the U.S. Navy is under is increasing too. So what's the uh, what's the end point here? Well, again, as I said on Tuesday, you know, the, the ultimate objective here is to ensure freedom of navigation through the Red Sea and to continue to work with the international community to safeguard mariners that are transiting uh, this area. And we'll continue to do that. Um, and, and again, you know, the, the more that the Houthis continue to do these types of attacks long, long term, uh, it is going to also, and, and in the medium and near term, it's going to continue to have significant impacts on their own citizens, the, the people that are living uh, under Houthi control uh, in terms of uh, the ability for aid to be delivered to Yemen, the environmental impact on the Red Sea, as well as the economic viability of that region. Uh, so again, you know, we're not looking to get into a full-scale conflict uh, with the Houthis. Our focus, again, continues to be on freedom of navigation and safety uh, of the Maritime Corridor, and that's what we'll stay focused on. Right. Louis. Um, um, what is the Department's comment on the situation that happened earlier this week in the Philippines at uh, Second Thomas Shoal? Um, the Philippine government has released video that shows a machete wielding, knife wielding, China Coast Guard um, mem service members attacking these uh, rigid hull boats belonging to the Philippines on a resupply mission. W what do you have to say to that? And then have a follow up, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of touched on this earlier this week, right? I mean, uh, this kind of behavior, it's provocative, it's reckless, um, it's unnecessary. Uh, it's also uh, antithetical to uh, the PRC's claims about respect for sovereignty. Um, and, and so, again, uh, the Philippines uh, should have the right to be able to operate uh, within their legal maritime claims. Uh, those need to be protected. So, again, we, we continue to stand by our ally, the Philippines, uh, and we're going to continue to call out this kind of uh, irresponsible and reckless behavior when we see it. And when you say standby, does that mean that the U.S. is considering moving some assets there to uh, kind of show uh, that um, support for uh, the Philippines? Yeah, I don't, I don't have any announcements to make, Louis. We're confident in our force posture in the region right now. Uh, and again, I'll just leave it at that. Cheney. Thank you, General. Um, on the U I mean, North Korea and Russia's uh, uh, mutual defense agreement, uh, this is a treaty that uh, allows the Russia to intervene military in case of emergency on the Korean Peninsula. What is the U.S.'s reaction on this? Well, again, w without getting into the specifics of their agreement, uh, the, the alliance that the United States has with the ROK and Japan is a defensive alliance, right? We're there to defend. We're th there to make war. Uh, and so, um, again, our focus is going to be on working with like-minded partners in the region uh, to include our allies, ROK and Japan, on ensuring uh, peace, security, and stability throughout the region. Can you tell uh, what is the difference between South Korea and the United States mutual defense agreement and North Korea and Russia's mutual defense agreement? Is any difference looks like? Or well, again, I'm not going to do a comparative analysis here from the podium in terms of the, the various agreements other than to say we've been very clear about our ironclad support for our ROK allies. But Kim Jong-un told President Putin he fully supported uh, Russia's uh, special military operation against the Ukraine. And uh, Putin promised uh, military technology support, including fighter jet to North Korea, what changed 
will this make to the war in Ukraine? Well, I just think it demonstrates the desperation uh, that a country like Russia needs to uh, align itself with the DPRK uh, to subjugate the people of Ukraine. Uh, and the fact that, that they have to go to a country like DPRK uh, to obtain munitions demonstrates how isolated Russia is right now. Uh, but again, our focus is on preserving regional peace and stability. Uh, and I'll just leave it there. I'm going to move on, Janie, if that's all right. Go to Laura. Thanks, Pat. Are you, uh, is, the, is the Pentagon concerned about an increased risk to U.S. troops in the region if Israel expands the conflict into Lebanon? Well, look, from the very beginning uh, of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, uh, we have been focused on ensuring uh, that our forces uh, are protected in the region. You saw we deployed additional forces uh, in support of deterrence efforts, but also force protection efforts. I'm not going to speculate or get into hypotheticals on what if, other than to say, again, we remain concerned about the potential for escalation along the Israel-Lebanon border, and we're going to continue to encourage a diplomatic resolution of that tension. Are you, is the Pentagon concerned about Israel's ability to wage a two-front war at the same time as it's... Uh, again, look, the, the focus here, uh, broadly speaking, is on preventing a wider regional conflict. And I, and I think, you know, you've all been following this region long enough to know uh, all the various players and actors that are in the region uh, that, that have a stake uh, in uh, that part of the world. And so, again, we're going to stay focused on encouraging a diplomatic resolution. Constantine. Thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> earlier this week, uh, Staff Sergeant Gordon Black was sentenced to three years and nine months by a, a Russian court. Um, uh, you know, first question, I guess, is does the Pentagon have a reaction to this sentence? And then the f uh, second question I have is, has anybody from the Pentagon been in contact with Staff Sergeant Black? Yeah, thanks. So obviously something that we continue to monitor closely, um, both the department and the Army are in contact with State Department, which has the lead, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, on something like this, uh, given a U.S. citizen being uh, held in a foreign country. Uh, so I'm going to have to refer you to State Department for any further questions on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Uh, so I have on the decision on to prioritize Patriot and NASEM's missile deliveries to Ukraine. So first, why now and not earlier? And secondly, why does it, uh, what does it mean for Ukrainians practically? Will they be receiving more of those missiles? Will it take less time for them to be delivered for Ukraine? So like, what is the, what will be the quality change here? Yeah. So, so as I'm sure you, you know, uh, the foreign military sales program obviously supports uh, numerous countries around the world. Um, but in this particular case, in terms of why now, what, we, what we're seeing uh, is Russia once again trying to destroy Ukraine's energy system uh, and infrastructure ahead of winter. Uh, and so they urgently need uh, air defense, additional air defense capabilities, which is again a topic you heard Secretary Austin talk about last week. Uh, and so providing Ukraine with additional interceptors more quickly, uh, it's an existential uh, situation. Uh, and so this uh, prompted the decision to resequence near-term planned deliveries of critical air defense interceptors to go to Ukraine. Uh, so um, that's the reason for why now. Uh, and practically what that means is that uh, it will increase their inventor inventories more quickly to enable them to continue to defend that critical infrastructure uh, and the civilian population as we go into the winter here. One more in Patriots. We saw Romania today announcing that they will also provide additional uh, system to Ukraine on the condition that the Allies and the United States would help them to fill that gap. So could you please speak more about that? Will the S replace the system that Romania is providing to Ukraine? Will it be something else? Yeah, so I won't speak for Ukraine uh, other than to say, again, as Secretary Austin highlighted last week in Brussels, and, and oh, by the way, has been talking about now for a long time is air defense continues to be a priority. And so the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, you know, over 50 allies and partners have coming coming together to find ways to provide capabilities to Ukraine when it comes to air defense. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, many countries have stepped up in that regard, whether it be Patriots, whether it be SAMTs, whether it be, uh, you know, the NASAMS capabilities. So 
Um, we're obviously grateful for those countries that continue to do that uh, and will continue to keep after that. Like, are there any specific plans to fill that gap for Romania? Because they are saying that there is a condition that allies and especially the United States will help to find a temporary solution. Yeah, well, look, again, without getting into specific details, um, as a, you know, both bilaterally and as NATO allies, we, we work with all of our partners uh, to take into account what their defense needs are, and we're going to do everything we can to support those. Um, you know, in, in the case of this resequencing here again, uh, all the affected countries were notified. Uh, and again, we're, we're working with them to make sure, as I highlighted to Tony, that, that industry can work to get those uh, requirements filled. Um, so across the board, you know, we're going to do what good allies do. Um, oh, by the way, the fact that we've resequenced uh, these uh, interceptor uh, deliveries for Ukraine, again, the, uh, the bottom line message here is to our allies and partners is if there's an existential threat, you know, we're going to step up and we're going to help you, as we are in this case. So, yes, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Yesterday, Pentagon Regulatory DSCA said it will sell thousands <coughs> of autonomous systems <coughs> and other military supplies to Taiwan. So, but uh, the Pentagon concern about the backlash from China, and also, do you feel that the Taiwan is adequately prepared for um, attack by China at this time? I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part? Last of all, these those. Also, do you feel that Taiwan is adequately prepared for an um, attack by China at this time? Yeah, so, you know, I guess uh, the way I'd respond to that is, as Secretary Austin has said, uh, we don't believe that uh, an attack is either imminent uh, or inevitable. Uh, and so uh, I'll just leave it at that. Time for a couple more. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. I'm regarding again to the tension of the border between uh, um, Hezbollah and uh, Israel. Um, there is some reports claiming that the Israeli officials have told the U.S. that they are planning to shift resources from southern Gaza to the northern of Israel in preparation for possible offensive against Hezbollah. So uh, do you confirm these reports? Have you seen these uh, reports? And, um, from the uh, last Tuesday, when the IDF has been approved uh, 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 operational plans for an offensive in Lebanon, since that approval, um, does the Israel ask for any uh, new ammunitions or weapons from the U.S.? And what discussions the DOD had to try to de-escalate the situation there? Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of the, that press reporting, like I'm not going to speak to... Uh, potential Israeli operations or, or planning, I'd refer you to them to talk about uh, their current status. Again, we've been very clear publicly and privately uh, that we want to see calm restored uh, along the border uh, in our conversations with, with partners in the region uh, to include uh, those in Israel and Lebanon. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals or speculate on, you know, if something could happen. Our focus right now is on preventing a wider regional conflict and on encouraging resolution of these tensions via diplomacy. So we'll continue to stay focused on that. And uh, another one, um, would you uh, give us an update about the status of these 2,000 um, <coughs> pound bomb shipments that uh, hold? Is it still on hold? And what about the other deal about the uh, F-15 uh, firefighters to Israel that already has been approved? Okay, that was five questions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so no no change uh, in the the one shipment that we paused of the the two thousand pound unguided munitions, uh, and as I mentioned on Tuesday, there you know final determination on how to proceed with that shipment has not been made. Uh, as far as uh, the press reporting on F fifteen sales, uh, as a matter of policy, we don't confirm or comment on proposed cases until they've actually been notified to Congress. So I'm not going to have anything additional. All right, we can do one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, last time the U.S. Central Command uh, conducted an airstrike in Syria, according to CENTCOM, a senior ISIS uh, official was killed. Do you believe uh, ISIS still have a stronghold in the region, and how much is this a threat? Um, so you know, we, we've talked about this in the past. So ISIS, as it uh, exists in Iraq and Syria, has been greatly diminished from where it was 10 years ago. Um, we have not seen an uptick in terms of ISIS activity, broadly speaking. 
That said, they do remain a threat, which is why, again, you continue to see uh, the international coalition uh, of, of which the U.S. is part focused on working with regional partners to prevent uh, a resurgence of ISIS and to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. And so uh, it's one of those things that, again, as we've all seen, you, you can't take your eye off of it. Uh, or else, you know, it can rear its ugly head again. Uh, and so we'll continue to, to stay focused as CENTCOM was and is vis-a-vis uh, -vis their news release. So, all right. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.